Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. In order to better understand the microwave background, our analysis of water now continues. We have just released this video on the subject and if you have not watched it, you need to have a look at it first. There are important lessons in that video. First, there are consequences to structure in matter. Water has bonds with very different ability to hold energy, and that fact must be recognized. Secondly, water has the proper hexagonal structure to produce the desired thermal emission. Third, liquid water is known to be a powerful absorber and emitter of microwave radiation. Fourth, water is able to sustain convection currents in order to reach thermal equilibrium and consequently it does not need to report an accurate temperature when it radiates energy. The temperature can be simply apparent, not real, and becomes a manifestation of its underlying structure. It is clear that cosmology has not properly considered the effects of water in their analysis of the microwave background. It is not that scientists actually eliminated water as a possibility in the early days. They simply never considered water as a potential source. In their mind, the Earth had a temperature near 300 Kelvin, so there was no point in thinking about water as producing a signal with an apparent temperature of only 3 Kelvin. As we learned in this video, when Penzias and Wilson made their discovery, they were well aware of the potential contributions of the Earth's atmosphere to their signal. At zenith, they measured a temperature of 6.7 Kelvin and attributed 2.3 Kelvin of that to the atmosphere. They were able to make that estimate by changing the elevation of the antenna relative to the horizon and thereby modulate the signal originating from the atmosphere. As to the source of the primary signal, they were much too quick to accept the possibility that they had somehow measured the average temperature of the entire universe. That idea had been advanced in cosmology and emphasized in the paper by Dyke et al. which preceded their own work. Relative to experimental misinterpretation, they were only concerned with the improbable. They claimed to have thought about the leftover radiation from atomic tests in the Pacific or the possibility that pigeon droppings in the antenna could have been a signal source, as one can learn in this review. But they never considered the hydrogen bond in water. That appears to be the case to this day throughout cosmology. Here is the absorption spectrum of liquid water. It is known that the hydrogen bond in water is responsible for the broad absorption by this liquid in the far infrared and microwave region, as one can learn in this paper. That should be giving cosmologists plenty of opportunity to be concerned, especially in light of the findings of the dimer as we saw in the last video. Still, our understanding of the absorption and emission of water throughout the electromagnetic spectrum remains limited and a continued source of debate as one can learn in this paper. As a result, and in order to highlight how far off base the cosmologists have been for the past 60 years since the Penzias and Wilson discovery, I wanted to take the time in the rest of the video to simply present some quotes from their books and papers. When I began my work in this area, I went back and read everything I could. I even used interlibrary loan to obtain the PhD dissertations of John Mather and David Woody because I wanted to understand what they knew at the time that the Ferris horn was designed. In the end, you will come to learn that cosmologists have always been off the mark when it came to understanding the possible emissions of the earth and of course from water and the oceans. They have treated the earth as a 300 Kelvin source without any regard for the behavior of water. As we will learn in the next video, water is far from acting as a 300 Kelvin source in the microwave. Now in order to make this experience as productive as possible, I will not read the quotes but simply comment on each one. Between each quote, there will be no sound for a period of a few seconds, such that you can pause the video if you choose to. That will make for a more efficient presentation and minimize the time involved for those who choose not to read every quote. 
We begin with this quote found in George Smuts' book. How could he ignore water when he was so aware of the behavior of the clouds? Now read what he writes relative to the effects of water condensing in his equipment on the way to Peru. How could he possibly keep ignoring the behavior of water and not give any care to what the hydrogen bond might be emitting? There is one more quote from George Smuts' book which is well worth posting, even though it does not directly relate to water. It highlights how confused the cosmologists are when it comes to understanding data analysis. Remember that in the WMAP and Planck data, the quadrupole has a very weak or non-existent amplitude, as we learned in this video. So what was George Smut removing from his data exactly in this quote? It is interesting to study how the earth and water were treated as possible sources of error relative to the microwave background by the cosmologists before the launch of COBE. As a direct precursor to the Kobe Fierce Horn, it is most appropriate to examine the Woody Mather instrument as described in their dissertations. Here is what Woody wrote relative to his experiment with John Mather. Did he really believe that this was all that was necessary in order to deal with the fact that we are sitting on a water planet? This is Mather's take on the question in his dissertation. This should have immediately instilled panic relative to the importance of water in the microwave background experiments. Yet for John Mather, it was just a question of removing the condensation within the horn. He never gave a second thought to the fact that there was plenty of condensed water thousands of meters below his antenna. What is even more surprising when reading page 54 of Dr. Mather's dissertation is that he was actually aware that the water dimer existed in the atmosphere. Yet he never extended that knowledge to ponder the importance of the hydrogen bond in thermal emission. In any event, Woody's dissertation provides a detailed error analysis associated with the interferometer-based spectrometer. This includes virtually every possible source of instrument error. But both Woody and Mather view Earthshine as originating from a 300 Kelvin blackbody source. They appear to properly model the atmosphere, water, oxygen, ozone, etc., but present no discussion of the expected thermal emission profile of water in the condensed state on Earth. On page 99 of Woody's dissertation and page 121 of Mather's, they do attempt to understand the response of their antenna to the Earth. On page 104, Woody places an upper limit on Earthshine, but the Earth is modeled as if it could produce only 300 Kelvin photons. On page 105, Woody reaches the conclusion that since the residuals on his fits for the microwave background are relatively small, even when Earthshine is not considered, then its effect cannot be very significant. The oceans are never discussed. Singal et al. were also aware of the problem with water condensing when dealing with open apertures. This is what they wrote in their paper. Of course, the problem was never reflection. It was emission from condensed water, as anyone considering the hydrogen bond would have recognized. This once again demonstrates that leading cosmologists had no understanding whatsoever of the emissive properties of water. Yet John Mather had plenty of opportunities to be concerned about water. Just examine what he writes in his book about the work in the Canary Islands. One would think knowledge that signal could be looking like cosmic fluctuations might raise a red flag. But who cared? After all, water is not supposed to be able to produce signals such as this, right? But the classic example of cosmologists dismissing data is seen with the Berkeley-Nagoya experimental results obtained just before the COBE satellite was launched. This is what John Mather had to say relative to those experiments. After the COBE results came in, Mather would write the following. Nonetheless, the Berkeley-Nagoya experiments provided a vital clue to the astrophysical community that there was a powerful interfering source nearby. But no one paid attention to that warning. The problem becomes front and center when the COBE team is confronted by Dave Wilkinson, who was concerned that they had not eliminated the possibility of emissions coming from the Earth, as Mather writes in his book. The WMAP satellite, of course, was renamed to honor Dave Wilkinson, so one would think that the COBE team would have been more attentive to his concerns. In any event, this is what Professor Wilkinson actually wrote in a paper. 
Unfortunately, Professor Wilkinson does not give any detailed outline of the question, and while there are signs of problems with the FIRAS data, the astrophysical community itself has not published a thorough analysis of the subject. Professor Wilkinson focused on the Earth as a 300 Kelvin blackbody source, even if the established behavior of the oceans in the microwave and far infrared suggested that the oceans were not radiating in this manner, as we will learn in the next video. Wilkinson never advanced that the Earth could be generating a signal with an apparent temperature of 3 Kelvin. That means that the diffraction problems could be potentially much more important than he ever suspected. Mather did outline Wilkinson's concerns in his book as mentioned above, but he did not elaborate further on these issues. In the end, not a single study examines the interaction of the Kobe shield with the fierce horn. The Earthshine issue was never explored and Wilkinson's concerns remained unanswered by the Fierce team to this day, as can be gathered from this quotation by Mather et al. As one can learn in this paper by Bard et al., the Fierce team has not established that an adequate shield was constructed to prevent RF interference from the Earth. The Sun-Earth shield simply prevents direct heating of the doer by visible or near infrared light. Nowhere in the Kobe literature is the RF performance of the sunshade analyzed. Finally, we come to this gem of a quote by Dr. Rainer Weiss. One would think that this would have highlighted that there is something really strange going on with water. Still, they viewed the presence of water bodies as features which merely simplified the acquisition of the signal they wanted. Why worry about nearby water sources when you think you are looking at the birth of the entire universe? As I have stated many times before, powerful signals imply proximal sources, and there is no question that the Kobe monopole signal is powerful, as we saw in this video. From the days of Penzias and Wilson, cosmologists have been very careful to consider the effects of the Earth's atmosphere in their measurements, aware that clouds can emit interfering radiation or scatter desired signals. However, they have always ignored the oceans of the Earth. But one thing is certain, those oceans are not microwave silent. They are powerful microwave emitters, as we will now learn in the next video. Yet if the hydrogen bond is able to emit in the microwave, then the cosmologists should ask themselves why that signal never interfered with their precious measurements. They have never been able to find the signal from the hydrogen bond, that is precisely because they have improperly assigned it to the universe. Well, that is all for now. If you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel, mention the videos to your friends and to your local astronomy club, support me with a like, and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars, and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below, and I'll see you soon on our next video.